Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We are studying together in the Epistle to the Galatians, verse by verse, and in our last study together, we had just reached verse 10 of chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, verse 10. As I've often pointed out, the Holy Spirit is the author, and I have time and time again in our studies pointed out that we are not looking at Paul's reasoning but that we are looking at the word of the sovereign God. It is the Holy Spirit who is speaking to us. And we have seen that in the eyes of our loving Heavenly Father, adding anything to the finished work of our Lord Jesus Christ is heresy. In fact, uh, shortly we'll see that it's quite dangerous. Uh, Take heed unto doctrine, for in so doing thou shalt save thyself and them that hear thee. If it is your desire to speak uh, before a church today, 90, 99% of them will tell you, please do not bring up any doctrinal issues. Just give a simple personal testimony. And folks, doctrine is the only thing that I know. Personal testimony will not deliver you. Personal testimony will not save you. But doctrine will. Take heed unto doctrine, for in so doing thou shalt save thyself and them that hear thee. Now that verse alone ought to convince modern Christianity that salvation is not justification, that salvation is not redemption. Salvation is deliverance. And the theme of our present study is deliverance from the law, deliverance from the human merit system, God did not choose you because you were choosable. God did not choose you because, well, there was something in you that said, wow, you know, this guy, he stands out head and shoulders above the rest of the human race. I'll choose him. That's just not how it happened. You know, I was the, the kid that when they chose up sides for playing uh, some sport, well, nobody wanted me. You know, eventually they, they shrugged and said, okay, we'll take him. When I hit a home run, boy, did things change. It was all human merit. In human judgment, you are not redeemed by works and nothing is added to the finished work of Jesus Christ. Now, a week ago, we looked at, uh, at how a little bit of, of error will leaven the whole lump. And a lot of people never stop to realize that something that they may consider to be true destroys all of biblical doctrine. And they never even bother to consider the logic. A little leaven leaveneth the entire lump. Now, in our present context, that leaven is adding something to the finished work of Jesus Christ. In the present context, that was circumcision. That meant that you had to be circumcised in order to be redeemed. And, uh, of course, you don't hear anybody talk about that today, but today there are all kinds of additions to the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Many who profess to be Christian, you know, you must be water baptized or you, or you can't go to heaven. So, uh, you know, my own mother can't go to heaven. If you go to a movie on Sunday, you know, you can go any other day, but Sunday, bad deal, bad deal. You know, that's not Christianity. That's destroying the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
a little leaven leaveneth the entire lump. Now look at the next verse. Remember that the Holy Spirit is the author. I have confidence in you through or in the Lord. It's one thing for you to say, well, that's Paul. Paul's the author. And he's got confidence in the Galatian Christians. And in the near sense that you can say that, but dearly beloved, the message this morning, the message from the Holy Spirit is I have confidence in you in the Lord. Okay? The I have confidence is a perfect tense. It's the word pytho. Uh, you've heard me talk about that word. The word persuaded. I am completely persuaded concerning you. It's a perfect tense. Uh, it was done in past time. And the perfect tense stresses the present reality of something that was completely done in the past. Well, what was done in the past? The vicarious offering of Jesus Christ. He died on the cross and He redeemed you. He paid the price. You and I were ransomed. It's the paying of a price. And we know what that price was. That price was His death in your place. He didn't die for you. He died in your place. He died instead of you. He died instead of you. That means you can't die. Now, do you suppose that the Holy Spirit is saying here, I have confidence in your flesh? You know, I'm going to make these grand decisions and this is what I'm going to do uh, in my strength and in my flesh. You know, we're soon going to uh, reach uh, in the chapter, you can't do that because the flesh doesn't do anything good. You know, the works of the flesh are manifest. Flesh does nothing good. Nothing. Nothing. Someone said to me, you know, oh, that's not true. I know a guy who's an atheist and he... he you know, he sees that somebody's in need and he goes by their house and he drops $1,000 in their mailbox, uh, doesn't even knock on the door. Uh, they never know where they, the money came from. You know, that's got to be a righteous act. Folks, my Bible says, and your Bible says, that the righteous act of the sinner is sin. He didn't do it for God. He didn't do it for the glory of God. He did it for some other reasons. He did it for his own personal gratification. The Word of God says that the plowing of the wicked is sin. The plowing of the wicked is sin. The high look and a proud heart and the plowing of the wicked is sin. Proverbs 21.4 I have confidence in you. I have confidence towards you in the Lord. There's where the confidence is. Those who were preaching that you needed to be circumcised in order to go to heaven had confidence in the flesh. That is why that the finished work of Jesus Christ is reduced to zero, to nothing. If you've got to be water baptized, well, there that's where your confidence is. If you have to be circumcised, that's where your confidence is. You know, one of the popular ones today in the uh, conservative circle is, you know, well, you're really, you're not really redeemed. If you don't make a public confession, and of course I can quote the the verse as well as you can. 
If thou shalt confess with thy mouth Jesus is Lord, and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be redeemed. Not what it says. Not what it says. Thou shalt be saved. That's how you're delivered from the law. That's how you're delivered from works. That's how you are delivered from the merit system. The world religious system based on human merit. By realizing that God Almighty became your kinsman redeemer, died in your place, paid the price, done. You are complete in Him. You are presented in His presence, holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in His sight. That's right. You in the messy condition that you're in today, every one of us, God Almighty says, I have confidence in you. No, you got to be kidding. I thought we had confidence in God. I thought it was the other way around. No. Not here in this context. And that's grace. I didn't say it. God says, I have absolute confidence in you. That's a perfect tense. Holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in His sight. We're not under law, but grace. Why? All the Word... Is for all, all of the word is fulfilled in, in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Which do you think would bring more glory to God? All right, you don't do X because it's wrong and you don't uh, want to do that which is wrong. You don't want to break the law and you fear the results of that uh, because God won't bless you and that'll bring difficulty in your life. Or... Or, you don't do X because you love God. And dearly beloved, clearly, the thesis of evangelical conservative Christianity is that our constraint is love. I have confidence in you, in the Lord. That's where the confidence is. Either... Jesus Christ did what He came to do, and it's done. Or it, it's only partially done. He came to seek and save the lost. Well, did He do that? He came to redeem His people from their sins. Did He do it? And if He did it, do you suppose He did a good job? How good a job do you think Jesus Christ did? Was it a, a batting average of 200, 400, 500? Or did, he, or did He completely do what He came to do? Did He, did he bat a thousand? The confidence in this verse is in the Lord. It's towards you. Ice in the, in the Greek. In the Lord. And that's where our confidence is. You, you are as close to God as you could possibly be in the person of His Son. I wish you realized that. I wish more Christians realized that. That you will be none otherwise minded. Well, now wait a minute. I mean, is that saying that there will not be one single believer who does not know absolutely the application of the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ and the absolute freedom from the constraints of the law? And of course, the answer, you know, I always get, you know, that's impossible. Because most of the Christians that I know are entangled in works. Yeah, but the new man, folks, is not entangled in works. The new man. The big problem that I think I see in modern Christianity, not, <coughs> well, I, wouldn't, I shouldn't say modern, really. Uh, it's been there ever since Christ was here, is the great emphasis on the flesh. Let's see, you know, you don't give enough, you don't pray enough, you don't work enough, you don't run enough, you don't, you know, uh, 
be concerned enough, uh, enough, 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 enough. It's all the energy of the flesh and blessed little comprehension of the finished work of Christ in the new creation, the new creation. You know, I scan for so-called Christian radio stations when I'm driving in my truck and time after time again, I'm told, you know, what I ought to do, you know, and where I ought to go and how I ought to do it and how I ought to pray and how I ought to give. And, you know, we got this tremendous work thing going. You know, these people will go to hell if you don't do this or that. And hardly ever, Hardly ever do I hear anybody tell me how great my Lord is, how wonderful He is, how much He's done for me. Virtually never do I hear anybody say, you know, I've got grand news for you. You're redeemed because Jesus Christ paid the price and you stand before Him holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in His sight. I've basically reached the conclusion that folks are afraid to preach that. Well, Steve, if I tell people that they're holy, unblameable, and unreprovable, well, they'll just go, they'll just go live any way that they want. Dearly beloved, the only reason that you'd live any way you want is because you're not a new creation. And if you are working for God's good graces, I'm, I got news for you. It isn't going to work. Our confidence is in recognizing that it's in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's your new man, not the old man. Okay? Not the flesh. You know, consider this situation. Here is the sovereign monarch of eternity who spoke the worlds into existence, who just he swept the dust from his workshop and placed the galaxies in their clusters. Okay? This almighty sovereign God says, I have confidence in you. which results in our, our comp confidence being in Christ, not in the way that we live and not in the way that we perform. I am convinced that the biblical theme is that whatever we do, we do because, because we love the Lord and we recognize what He's done for us. The Holy Spirit goes on and, and says, Steve, I have absolute and complete confidence in you and that, that you will be none otherwise minded. And I can look back over my life. You know, when I first started to teach this book, you know, and one of the things that I continually am thankful for is that they didn't have YouTube or the Internet back when I started. I'm absolutely convinced that I taught more error than I do today. My God says, I have confidence in you, in the Lord, that you will be none otherwise minded. Now, just think about this. Do you suppose that that's the mind of the flesh or the mind of the spirit? It's no wonder that God says it is He who works in us both the will and to do of His good pleasure. That's our God. The God of most Christians isn't able to do that. But the God of the Bible says that He is working in you to will and to do of His good pleasure. Okay. Okay. Samson's parents, they didn't know that it was of the Lord, but it was of the Lord. That ye will be none otherwise minded. Okay? But look at the contrast. Look at the contrast. 
the great contrast here. But he that troubleth you shall bear his judgment whosoever he be. Very sobering verse. We know there's no judgment for those in Christ. Hold that thought. That none otherwise minded is not the mind of the flesh, but the mind of the spirit. You cannot convince me. You'll never convince me that it is a biblical principle that God is converting the mind of the flesh, that God is cleaning it up and repairing it, and that it'll finally become a good mind. Folks, the works of the flesh are manifest, and that's where the mind always is. It's where it's always at. The adultery, fornication, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, election fraud. Oh, all right, I, I threw that in for free. But the mind of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, meekness, faith, self-control, that you will be none otherwise minded. But he that troubleth you shall bear his judgment. Okay? He that agitates you. You should have a settled peace in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And anybody, anyone that agitates that or stirs that up shall bear his judgment, whosoever he be. All right? I believe God is saying that the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ is the crowning glory and grace of all, Almighty, eternal God. What did Uzzah do wrong in reaching out to stabilize the ark? God struck him dead. Oh, wait a minute, Lord. I mean, all he did, all he was trying to do was help you out. Well, that's the problem. The Almighty, the Almighty Sovereign God does not need your help. He doesn't need my help. Oh, Pastor Steve, there's so many things God wants us to do, and we don't do them. Poor God, he's, he's frustrated. Is that your God? He that agitates you, upsets you, troubles you in the finished work of Jesus Christ. For the context is adding something to what Christ has done. That is the context. I believe that what Christ has done is most precious to God. Think about it. Think about how precious it must be to Him. I pointed out in, in several studies that people who were struck dead in the Scriptures are interesting people. You know, David, you know, he murders a, a guy, he committed adultery first with the, the, that man's wife and then murdered him to hide that. God didn't strike him dead. Steve, what a terrible God that was. Struck Nadab and, and Abihu dead. But he left David alone. In fact, David was still king. What kind of God is that? You know, we tried to impeach the president for a lesser offense. And yet David was still king of Israel. You know, and people have said, boy, that's, that's a terrible thing God did. You know, and I think, wow, I don't know about that. I just imagine all of the ladies, you know, behind the scenes, you know, saying, uh, you know what David did? Anyway, the people he did strike dead are, are Nadab and Abihu, who offered heresy, false worship, and dearly beloved, I believe God is very, very jealous of His glory. That's why you don't, we don't operate out of the flesh. That's why there's nothing good in the flesh. 
God Almighty became your kinsman and He died in your place. And to say that that is not enough, well, they shall bear their judgment whoever they may be. Now, I, personally, I think that that can be the fleshly part of the individual as well as another person. It says here that for preaching false doctrine or error, there is judgment, and yet we see that there is no judgment in Christ Jesus. And I, I admit that, that we all occasionally preach error. No one has a handle on all truth. So just what kind of judgment are we looking at? We can't, we can't throw out Romans 8.1. I believe that it can be the judgment on the old man as much as a judgment on a false teacher, but not the new creation. I do not, I do not believe that the old me is going to heaven. I believe it's judged in Christ and it's the new creation that stands before God without judgment. Holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in His sight. I'd, uh, I'd prefer that your mind be settled on things above, on Christ, not things below. Flesh, law, human performance, human merit. So it occurs to me that not only is it a disturbance that somebody else can cause us and a disturbance that we can have within, one of the comforts, folks, I have all the time is the fact that God is in control, that everything is settled. And no matter what happens in the arena that we find ourselves in, we are watching His plan being carried out in and through us. I want you to just quickly look at the next verse. And, and I, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, I'm not, I'm not uh, going to get into this verse in great detail uh, this week, but look, look what that said. I mean, you may just skip over that quickly, but what the Holy Spirit is saying there is that Paul did preach circumcision. That's what he did. But he changed. From the road to Damascus on, he didn't preach circumcision. Now you can go back to something that you did years ago and you can bemoan your failure. Many Christians do that. I doubt Paul did when he came to realize that it was God who worked in him both the will and do of his good pleasure. He knows the paths that you take and he says, after he's tested you, you shall come forth as gold. He bottles your tears. He lights your candle. These people who came in with this legalistic approach in Galatia said, wait a minute, you know, you're listening to Paul. You, you know what Paul did. And then, well, they could bring up all, all he did to persecute the church of God. He excelled among all of his brethren. He hauled Christians into jail. He was consenting to Stephen Stoning, the first Christian martyr. The man that zealously preached circumcision was Paul. And so these guys come into Galatia and they, and they say, you know, look, you're listening to this guy. You're listening to him. He used to be, he used to be one who strenuously supported right to life, but, well, right now he supports a woman's right to choose. And that's what they're saying of Paul. I'm not still preaching circumcision. And I can prove that, basically is what he's saying, I can prove that because if I were, 
I wouldn't be suffering persecution. Now in closing, let me point this out. If you preach human works, you're not going to have a difficult time in the Christian community. But, if you preach the finished work of Jesus Christ, that you stand before Him without spot and without blemish, only because of what He did, nothing more, you will not only be the enemy of the state, but you'll be the enemy of the Christian community. And that's something that you need to understand. It's just, it's too easy to go along with the crowd. Paul used to preach this, but when he quit preaching human merit, what happened? He began to suffer persecution. And folks, I'm telling you that if you stand staunchly for the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. You'll be thrown out of most churches today. That's a terrible, terrible thing to say, but it's true. Because the Gospel is what Christ did. It's not about what you must do. It's about what He did. It's the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Preach that. And I guarantee you, you'll suffer persecution. I was, uh, I was eating at a truck stop diner years ago with, uh, with a fellow who said, you know, uh, well, are you a Christian? And I said, yes. So he handed me a tape. He said, I, I sing gospel songs. And we had wonderful fellowship. I mean, boy, it was just wonderful. You know, we talked about the Word. And then I mentioned that Jesus Christ paid it all. That we stand before Him without spot, without blemish. And He said to me, He said, well, there, there's where I draw the line. And He never spoke another word to me. That's the wrong place to draw the line, folks. This is not humanistic Christianity. We are new creations in Christ Jesus because of what He did and only because of what He did. And God has confidence in us. Praise His name. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we're so very thankful for your word, for the privilege and the opportunity that you've given us to think about it. Oh, may the Holy Spirit just take what's been said and filter it so that the error and, and the foolishness be taken out so that our minds and our hearts might be settled on things above and we might rejoice in all that you've done for us. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. We love you all. We truly do. Rest in Him. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.